Deakin University students. Well, hopefully you can hear me now. My name's Chris Humphrey and I'm a zoologist and I live at my very own private zoo. So I care for 2000 animals. So I have an immense animal family. That's why my hair's so messy. I work 24 seven. So today we're gonna to have a great afternoon, an uplifting afternoon learning about Australian animals and why we all need to protect them because biodiversity is so important for our own health. Now, of course, we're all animals and some of these students are definitely animals. I can see you back there. We're all animals, we're classified as a mammal and we belong to the phylum Chordata, which means that we have a backbone. Can you feel your spine? Some of us don't have a spine these days, but we're a mammal, we're warm blooded, we've got hair, we drink milk. You all knew that in your primary school days, but I've got animals today which are a little bit different. I have scaly skinned reptiles, I have birds, I have some insects, I have all sorts of creatures and every animal has a job to do, just like you and I. We're all good at something and we're all special and unique and valued. But the first creature today, I know some of you have just had your lunch or waking up from breakfast in India, but this is a giant burrowing cockroach and I know what you're thinking I didn't get online today to look at a cockroach but yes you did these are very special animals they're not the germy variety which you sometimes find underneath your refrigerator these are unique rainforest denizens of northern Queensland and they're good because they basically break down all of the nutrients they eat the dead leaves and the bark they spit it out poo and they make the soil for our plants to grow in. They unlock all of the nutrients. These animals are keystone species and without them, the rainforest would decay. Now, have a good look. This creature here has six hairy little legs. It's an insect and it belongs to the phylum Arthropoda, which means its skeleton is on the outside of its body. Now, I know it might look a little bit creepy to some of you, but this creature is vital for a healthy planet. Can you see those little hairy, antennae they're feeling around finding their way about and of course go back to your primary school days insects have three body parts the head the thorax which the legs, legs are attached to and the big fat behind the abdomen it's kind of like a school lunchbox that's where they keep all of their fat reserves this little creature here can live for a month without having to eat a meal and a curious adaptation is that these animals, they look after their young. They practice maternal and paternal care. They look after their babies in a cockroach crèche. And you can tell this one's a male. He's got a big scoop on his carapace. It kind of reminds me of a skateboard ramp. And they use that big scoop to push and bust their way through the rainforest understory. This creature is subterranean. It lives underneath the ground and comes out at night time. Are you students? Are you nocturnal? Maybe perhaps on a Friday or Saturday night, but you're not meant to be. You're meant to be diurnal. That's a good word, diurnal. Next time you play Scrabble, put that one on the board. Now, I might put my beautiful cockroach away. We'll move on to another group of creatures, another class of animals. Here comes a group of animals of a class called reptilia. And doesn't matter where you live in the world, reptiles abound. And here comes a lizard. And this creature coming out today, be warned, he might poke out his tongue like this, He's not being rude or cheeky, he's smelling. He's sensing his environment. That's how they sniff. That's how they find their food. This creature here, I want you all to have your manners on today because this creature here, can you say hello? That's his tail, you silly duffers. This is his head. And you see, if he pretends he's got two heads, predators won't eat him. What a great adaptation. Now the big fat tail is still with food and he can live for three months without having to eat a meal. Now students, you can tell he's a boy, he's got a big, fluffy, fat head. And boys have bigger heads than the females. These animals are monogamous. They live for 50 years and mate for life. That's a very rare trait this day and age. But we need to look after this creature. You know why? His ecological job is eating up all of the wildflowers in the Australian bush, in the woodlands. He eats up the flowers, he poops out the seed from his back end, and as he's moving about, he drops the seed across Australia's barren landscape. That is an awesome job. We need to protect them. Sadly, they get run over by vehicles when they're sunbaking in the middle of our roads and highways. Why would they sit in the middle of the road? That's it. They're ectothermic, cold-blooded reptiles love to sun worship. They sunbake to heat up their bodies. Now, unlike you and I, we go to the shops to buy our clothes. This lizard, he sheds his skin. He sloughs his skin. It peels off like a dirty old sock and he makes a new shiny skin underneath. It beats going to Kmart a lot cheaper. Now, his ossified bony skin protects him from attack 
from perhaps a kookaburra or a currawong or a brown falcon. It's great body armor. Now, in scientific terms, we use binomial names. And the scientific name of this lizard is Taliqua rugosa, which means bumpy, wrinkly skin. So remember, a bit of a test after every animal today. Why is he poking at his tongue? I've got a frog in my throat. He's smelling you. Now, I'd like to put him away now. Let him have a bit of a snooze. I'm about to choke at the moment. <clears throat> it's a live Zoom. You never know what might happen. I've got another creature coming out. I'm just going to have a swig of water. So hmm. it's been a rough day. The next creature coming out, it is a gecko. Now, in Australia, we have five main families of lizards. And this is a very unique lizard to the Australian rainforest. This is Celturarius cornutus. This is the northern leaf-tailed gecko. Now, you find geckos throughout the world. But this gecko is interesting because Australian geckos, they lack eyelids. So guess how they keep their eyes clean? They lick their eyes clean with their long tongues. I can lick my nose, but I shouldn't brag about that. They lick their eyes, so no need for a face washer when you're a leaf tail gecko. But have a good look at those big eyes. He comes out at nighttime nocturnal. But this creature has amazing cryptic camouflage. All those blotches and splotches help him to adapt to hide on the lichen encrusted trees where he lives in the rainforest. But another interesting adaptation. By the way, this gecko is about 20 years old. His tail is filled with cartilage and fat reserves. And if a kookaburra grabs him on the tail, he drops his tail. That's called autotomy. He drops his tail, runs off. He can regenerate his tail again. That is amazing. Now, this gecko, although he's a Mick Jagger of the lizard world licking his eyes, he's got some other interesting habits. He sits out in the rain at nighttime and all the spines on his body grab the dew or the rain and they drip into his mouth. Now you might be thinking, why do we need geckos in our environment? What do they do? What's their purpose? These guys eat up all the insects. That's a great job. That's their ecological niche. We need to protect them. Sadly in Australia, we have lots of feral cats and people let their cats run around and cats gobble up our beautiful lizards in the daytime and at nighttime. So remember, if you get attacked, if you're a gecko, what can you do? You can regenerate your tail again, drop your tail as a decoy, run away and regenerate your tail again. That is amazing. Now, I'd like to put my gecko away because I have another lizard coming out now. Now, I believe some of you today are from India and you're used to the water monitors in India. While I have a close cousin here today, it's an indigenous lizard to Victoria and up the east coast of Australia. It's a varanid, a monitor. It has a forked tongue. It's related to the Komodo dragon, and this one packs a punch. He has necrotic saliva in his mouth. If he bites you, guess what? It'll ruin your day. Necrotic saliva, your flesh uh, drops off, and it's not a good look. Now, aha, this is Godzilla, and he is a lace monitor. Oh, he almost bit me on the face. Did you see that? Wouldn't that have been pretty cool? Now, a lace monitor is a carnivore. He eats snakes and that's why we need to protect him although he looks quite formidable he is he's got razor sharp paws and a body built for speed but he eats up all the tiger snakes red belly black snakes and copperheads in eastern australia but sadly he's endangered because he's lost a lot of his habitat humankind has taken down a lot of the trees the hollows where they sleep and hibernate and also the termite mounds where they lay their eggs so we need to protect him at all costs. He protects biodiversity and he keeps all the venomous snakes in check and balance. Now, some other adaptations. If you could touch him today, students, he kind of feels like crimson. He feels like security mesh and snakes' fangs find it difficult to penetrate through his hard skin and check out his long tail. It's like a bull whip and he'll whack you with that tail. And if you're a dingo, you'd think twice about eating him. Now, he is the second largest lizard in the land. Does anyone know the largest lizard in Australia? It's called the Parenti Monitor. But remember, varanids always have a forked tongue. We need to protect him. Remember, what does, what does he do? He eats up all of the venomous snakes. Now, I'd like to put him away. And I have some more creatures coming out today. And he just ripped my T-shirt. There you go. A bit risque, but um, I didn't do that on purpose. Now, the next creature coming out. Jamie, we've got an escapee over here. Never know what's happening behind the scenes today, my Zoom Zoom, but this is an eastern long-necked turtle, not a tortoise. Students, you know the difference? Tortoises live on the land. They're terrestrial. And turtles are aquatic. They have swimming feet, web feet or flippers. And this turtle here I've had since I was a little kid. 
I've had many of these animals since I was a child. And Terence here was given to me when I was a nine-year-old boy. And I've, how old do you think I am now? 35, 36? Be kind. I'm 47, so I've had him for a very, very long time. But this creature here has got some great adaptations. His long neck, it's like an ambush predatory mechanism. He whacks out his long neck to grab his prey. And on the back of his shell, that is called his carapace. It can't come off. It's actually his vertebra fused together. And underneath, that's called his plastron. They're his rib bones stuck together. So think about it. No bills, no rent. He's always on the holidays. But students, think about it. I know he's a cute creature, but what does he do for our environment? How does he keep our environment safe and biodiverse? Do you know what they do? Turtles, scientists believe turtles are very responsible for keeping our waterways clean. They eat up all the dead fish and all the crustaceans. They digest the food and they stop our waterways becoming deoxygenated and polluted. So not just a dumb animal, a very important animal to save. If you live in Victoria or Australia, even abroad in India and Asia, don't put your rubbish on the ground, put it in the bin, recycle, reduce, reuse, recycle, and make sure our plastic waste doesn't get into our water systems. So another adaptation, look at his ears. He doesn't need to have swimming plugs in his ears, earplugs. He's got a flapper skin over his ear called a tympanum, and that stops the water going into his ear canal. So students, recap. Tortoises live where? on the land and turtles live in the water. So I'd like to put my Eastern long neck turtle away, a perfect ambush predator. And I'd like to bring out my oldest friend in the world. Just gonna get my arms down a bit today, don't I? That's a PG show. This frog here is my oldest friend in the world. Now we're learning about classification today for fun. We've looked at reptiles. Frogs are not a reptile. What are they called? They're classed as an amphibian, amphibia. And Frogs don't have scales, they have a glandular skin. If you look closely, you can see little pores in their skin. They drink through their skin like a, like a sponge. Now, that's very important for frogs' health because if they live in a, a polluted environment, well, basically they can die very quickly. They're very sensitive to human pollution. Now, big eyes indicates to me he comes out at nighttime, but frogs have a very interesting adaptation. They shed their skin when they grow bigger but they don't throw their skin in the bin and discard it. They eat their own skin. Ah, oh, disgusting. This frog doesn't go red at for an apple, la di da di da This frog goes like this. <coughs> they often sit in people's drain pipes at nighttime up the east coast of Australia, and that amplifies their croak. It's like a microphone, and that helps them to attract more lady suitors. I think they're beautiful. I wonder if I gave it a kiss. Oh, it didn't turn into a princess. People do wonder at times. Now, I'm going to put my frog away. I have some other creatures coming out. And this, oh, I've got some snakes. Now, many of you today might be thinking, oh, I don't like snakes. But you know what? I love them because they eat up all of the mice and the rats. Snakes are great animals. I know they're a bit scary, but if you see one, don't whack it over the head and try and kill it. Leave it be. Let it do its job. Let it eat up all of the mice and the rats. Because my worst nightmare is seeing a mouse. I'm petrified. Now, these snakes here, they are one of the smallest python species in the world. These are called large blotched pythons or Stimson's pythons. And they live in the dead heart of Australia around the Western McDonald Ranges in Alice Springs. And you can see their body coloration. That's a dead giveaway where they live around the rocky outcrops of the desert around Alice Springs, browns and yellows. But can you see them poking out their tongues? They're smelling you. But these snakes, they might look like babies, but they're full growing. Some of these snakes here, this one here is about 20 years of age. Now, if you look carefully underneath its chin, it's got these little holes along its face called labial pits. These animals don't use their eyesight to hunt their food. They pick up the infrared that we mammals emit from our warm mammalian bodies. They hunt you at nighttime like Predator in the movies. You remember Arnold Schwarzenegger? This snake here eats bats and rats, even frogs. And they have the ability to unlock their jaw bones and eat something the size of their head 10 times. Now, they don't have a chin bones. Python snakes don't have a chin bone, so they can unlock and defuse their lower jaw to stretch out their mouth like a stretchy balloon like that. This snake doesn't have a six pack. They have a 220 pack. So these snakes are incredibly, incredibly agile climbers. So remember, if you see a snake in your back garden, it doesn't matter where you live in the world, look after them, protect them, I know they're a bit scary, but these animals, we need to protect them at all costs. They keep our planet 
rid of rodents. Now, I'd like to put my beautiful large blotch pythons away because this snake here, it's one of my favorites. This is a black-headed python. And this snake lives north of the Tropic of Capricorn in Australia. Now, he's got a beautiful, vivid black head and its scientific name is Aspidites malonocephalus. And Aspidites refers to the shields, the scales on its head. Big, robust scales for digging a hole in the ground. It's a burrowing snake, but it's got a black head to help it thermoregulate much more quickly in the sunshine. For students, I want you to think, why wouldn't it be black all over if it lives in tropical warm places? That's right, it would overheat. And that's a problem for a reptile because if you get too hot, you don't sweat when you're a reptile and you can die by overheating. Now, this snake also employs flicker fusion, a bit like a tiger or a zebra, all those stripes down its body help deter predators from attacking it. If they slither quickly, it kind of gives a hawk or a wedge-tailed eagle a bit of a migraine. But snakes are interesting and curious creatures. They only need to eat about 10 meals a year. I eat 10 times a day. And I'm a bit of a greedy guts, but we've all got warm blood. Snakes have cold blood or ectothermic. So they heat up their bodies externally. It's a very sustainable way to live. Now, I've got another creature coming out now. And this snake, actually, we don't have another snake. We have a crocodile to show you. You want to see a crocodile? Now, throughout the world, there's about 30 different species of crocodilians. There's caimans, there's gharials in India, there's uh, alligators in the Americas, and Australia has the largest reptile on planet Earth, the saltwater crocodile. But this one's a freshwater crocodile. It's got a much more narrower, tapered snout. And this crocodile, He's got a little bandage around his mouth today just to stop my insurance premiums going up. They love to snap. And this crocodile here, this one's called Moriarty. I have names for all of my animal friends. Now that's just a nice bit of neoprene and an elastic band around his mouth. You see crocodiles isometrically are very weak and open their mouths. They're designed to close. And do you know the crocodile's jaw pressure, their PSI is 3,700 PSI. Human beings, when we chew on a steak or a sandwich, our PSI, our pound per square inch, jaw pressure is only 150 PSI. So this crocodile packs a punch when it bites. But crocodilians are interesting. Freshwater crocodiles, they don't have 32 teeth like human beings do. They have 66 teeth and their teeth grow back continuously again and again and again when they lose them. I wonder if they have a tooth fairy. They'd be very busy. But crocodiles are also very curious creatures, they have a third eyelid. The third eyelid slides across like a windscreen wiper on a car. You can open your eyes for me, Moriarty. There you go, do you see that? Their third eyelid, it's transparent. They can see through their third eyelid like a built-in pair of windscreen wipers. But let's also have a good look at some of the other adaptations. This crocodile's been on planet Earth for hundreds of millions of years. They're perfect for survivors. But have a good look at the scales on its tail. They're called scoot scales. It kind of reminds me of a stegosaurus dinosaur. So freshwater crocodiles only grow to about three meters in length. The saltwater crocodiles, sorry, a long day. The saltwater crocodiles grow to 8.6 meters in length, the largest predatory reptile on planet Earth. Now I'm going to put my crocodile away, but it's a quick quiz, students. How many teeth does a freshwater crocodile have in its mouth? 32? Uh-uh. 66 sharp teeth. And how many eyelids do they have? Not two like we do, but three. And remember, crocodiles, they can be a bit scary, but they're apex predators. They do a great job. They eat up all of the herbivorous grazing animals like kangaroos and waterfowl, and they keep the balance. Every animal has a job to do. Now, I'm going to put Moriarty away. We'll take the bandage off its mouth this afternoon, and we'll give him a micey pole for being a good sport. Now, I'll put him away. I have something very cute to show you now. Not everything's scaly today. I have... A mountain pygmy possum. And if you're an Aussie, you may have heard of this critically endangered species. This creature here is not a mouse. It's not a rat. If it was, I would faint. This is a marsupial, a mini marsupial with a pouch. The babies grow up inside in the pouch, and the gestation period of a mountain pygmy possum is only 15 days, compared to people, nine months. So 15 days, they give birth to four young. Now, this little creature here is not trembling out of fear. This little possum here has a heart rate of about 260 beats per minute. It's almost humming like a little hummingbird. But this creature here is critically endangered. They, they're called a snow possum. They live 1,800 metres above 
sea level. 7.5 square kilometres is their distribution range. They're found on Australia's tallest mountain, Mount Kosciuszko, Mount Hotham and Mount Buller. But the reason why they're endangered is because of climate change. You see, ironically, there's less snow, they're freezing to death because they use the snow as an insulation blanket over the winter period when they hibernate. This little possum here can hibernate for six months of the year and they have to get up to 100 grams so they can hibernate for that long. But beautiful creature, big eyes for seeing at night. And these little whiskers are used for feeling around for insects as they're hunting for bogon moth. But another curious feature, this little mountain pygmy possum has a curly whirly tail. It's called a prehensile tail. They use it like a monkey's tail and they climb up into the trees as they're slurping for nectar and their powder puff like fur picks up all of the pollen and as they feed, they cross pollinate all of the flowers, creating seeds. So this little mountain pig and possum is vital for biodiversity in our alpine communities in Australia. So we need to protect them. And of course, because of climate change, they're disappearing, but they also have other threats, European red fox and cats, introduced European cats are gobbling them up as well. So there's only 2000 left on planet earth. And at Wild Action Zoo, we have 50 breeding adults that we breed and we share with other like-minded zoos around the country. Hopefully we can save them from extinction. Here comes another animal. It's another critically endangered animal. And sadly, Australia has some of the worst, we have the worst record of mammalian extinctions in the world. Sadly, we've been isolated in Australia as an island for such a long time. This next creature hasn't coped well with introduced predatory animals like foxes and cats and dogs. I know what you're thinking, folks from overseas and abroad. It's not a rat. This is the mini tiger kangaroo. It's called a rat kangaroo, a very unfortunate name, but it's a little mini macropod, a potoroa day. And there used to be 60 million of these animals hopping across Australia. Now there's less than 5,000. So can you see its little tail? They use it for grabbing onto branches and sticks, making a dray on the woodland forest floor of Australia. You might be thinking, I don't care about it brush tail betongs. I don't care if they become extinct. Well, you should, because these animals are like a gardener of the Australian forest. They rake up the ground as they're hunting for their insect larvae food. Can you see those claws? They're like little gardening rakes. And as they're digging, they disturb all the microbes in the soil or the little microorganisms. They help the animals proliferate microorganisms and helps the trees to synthesize nutrients, having more microbes in the soil. So this creature is vital for a healthy forest. Who would have thought that an animal like a brush tail betong is so important for the health of a forest. So we need to protect them. Thankfully, they're still protected in islands and places where there's no predators behind predator proof fencing. The next creature coming out, I would like to bring out, I would like to bring out, ooh, a barn owl. This is a hoo, 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 a raptor, a nighttime creature. And we have many owl species in Australia and throughout the world, but folks, this barn owl is found in every country of the world, every continent except Antarctica. And you find these around Deakin University in Burwood campus. This creature hatched in my hand from an egg and her name is Ozzy. She lives in my laundry. Sometimes she goes missing and she's hiding in the dryer. Now, I'll just pop out for a minute. Back again. This barn owl here is one of my favorite animals in my animal family. You can't have favorites, but we all do. And you might see her doing a bit of a boogie woogie with her head today, shaking her head around. She's not dancing the doof doof. Her ears are asymmetric. Her left ear is lower than her right ear. So when she's doing this with her head, she's three-dimensionally listening. She's triangulating sound. So if there's a mouse on the ground, she doesn't have to see it. She can pinpoint it and drop on it with those talons and grab it and snare it and kill it with those talons on her feet. Now, this owl also has an interesting adaptation. She has seven more vertebrae in her neck than we do. She has 14 vertebrae and that allows her to spin her head around 270 degrees, kind of like Exorcist the movie. Don't watch that show this weekend. So we're having a bit of fun today, but it makes sense, doesn't it? For everyone and every community, every area which we live in, putting up a nesting box for a native owl species to call your home their home and they'll eat up all of the rats and the mice. So I'll put my owl away now. And I just wanna ask you a couple of quick questions. How many degrees can she spin her head around? That's right, 270 degrees. And the claws of an owl 
are called talents. So she's known as a raptor. I love owls. They're sensational animals. I'm going to put it back in here. And I'd like to bring out another creature. And we've got some creatures there. Any animal you like. I've got a ringtail possum. And this ringtail possum is actually a much maligned species of creature up the east coast of Australia. Many of you folks in Victoria would have them living in your back garden. But the biggest pressure for them is urbanization and our domestic pets. So if you own a cat, lock it up daytime and nighttime, keep it indoors, enclosed, because cats are the worst enemy for this adorable little possum here. Isn't she a sweetheart? Now, big eyes, obviously, they come out at nighttime. And the scientific name of a ringtail possum is Pseudochirus peregrinus, which means false hand, because they use their tail like a hand. Look at that. They use their tail like an extra hand to grab on the branches. And peregrinus means pilgrim or alien. I kind of think she looks like he's got alien eyes. E.T. phone home. Big eyes. But in the daytime, when we're working, they sleep in a possum nest called a dray. D-R-E-Y. And they've got an interesting adaptation. They're coprophagic, which means they eat their own poop. And I know it sounds gross, but they're a poo-eating possum. You know why? Because... The food that they eat, like Australian eucalyptus leaves and wattle leaves, are very low in nutrients. So in the daytime, when they're having a bit of a slumber, they do a poop, they re-ingest their poo again to re-ingest the nutrients which they might have wasted in their droppings. What a curious adaptation, but a master of uh, survival in our Australian bush. It's a very hard place, Australia, to survive. Now, I've got my ringtail possum. I'll put her away because I've got uh, another creature here. This is... The fair dinkum deal. This is a kangaroo. We'll get to a sugar glider in a minute. But this is Elby. And Elby actually lives in my house. She jumps into my daughter's bedroom in the morning and jumps on her face. Serves her right when she leaves the door open. But this is a kangaroo island kangaroo. Macropus phylogenosis phylogenosis. And macropus means big feet, macropod. And phylogenosis means sooty ears. See how she's got little sooty points? Now, these kangaroos, were hit really badly in our last bushfires on Kangaroo Island. And this little Joey here is about 10 months old. Her mother kicked her out of the pouch and the mother didn't want to take her back again. So Albie now lives on my couch in my house with my family. But can you see these big clod hopping feet? Very hard to find Nikes for those down at the shops. And if you have a good look at its syndactyl claw here, see that split claw? They use that claw to comb all of the bindies and grass seeds out of their fur. Maybe I should get a little syndactyl claw for my hair. But this is a quintessential Australian animal, our national emblem, and we need to look after them. And sadly, if you're not from Australia, sadly in Australia, we take kangaroos for granted. We don't realise how important they are. They eat up all of the grass, they poop out all the seed, and they spread seed across our barren landscape. And sadly, people, they don't drive, they don't drive effectively well at night time, drive too quickly and hit our kangaroos, and people walk their dogs off leashes, attacking our kangaroos. I think we live in the best country in the world. We need to save our beautiful creatures. Mwah! I'm actually allergic to kangaroos, but that's a different story. Now, the next creature. We have so many different marsupials in Australia, and this is one of my favourites. It's called a gliding possum, Petaurus breviceps. Tightrope dancer. That's what breviceps means. And this little possum here lives up the east coast of Australia in our eucalyptus woodlands. These possums don't glide, oh, sorry, fly, they glide. They've got a patagium, a flap of skin attached to their wrist, to their ankle, and they glide from tree to tree, 50 metres in fact. But they use their tail like a rudder on a boat, which helps them to steer and control their gliding and their direction. But look at those big eyes. She is adorable. And her powder puff fur helps her to pick up all the pollen and cross-pollinate all of the flowers making our seeds. A sugar glider, Petaurus breviceps. Now, wouldn't it be great if everyone put up nesting boxes in their back gardens? You could do this in India. You could do this up the east coast of Australia, in our back gardens, even in Burwood around Deakin University and create habitat for animals and you can call your home their home as well. The next creature. Now, I know what you're thinking when you see this creature. You're going to go, ah, oh, disgusting, a stinky, horrible bat. Oh, it's just attacking the camera. This is a grey-headed flying fox. You find these throughout Southeast Asia, mega bats. But this bat here, it's a vulnerable species to extinction in our state of Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland and South Australia. 
because human beings have taken away the habitat of this beautiful flying mammal. This is the largest bat in Australia and it's called a frugivore. And they eat up all of the fruit, they poop it out and they spread seed across our landscape. They poop every 20 minutes and they can fly 200 kilometers a night. That's a lot of poop and a lot of seeds. But this gray headed flying fox, you can tell it's a male, he's got some uh, blonde tips in his neck. Now, word of warning, do not touch a wild bat. They can have diseases in their saliva. So I'm actually vaccinated with the rabies vaccine so I can pick up a gray headed flying fox. But this gray headed flying fox has a membrane of skin called a patagium and the membrane of skin is actually the hand of the bat. Now, one interesting tip, don't do this yourselves, but gray headed flying foxes, when they get ectoparasites like mites and ticks, they hang upside down. They don't go to chemist's warehouse to get a fancy shampoo. They actually urinate on themselves and that burns off all of the ticks and mites and parasites. Ooh, disgusting. Now I'd like to put my gray headed flying fox away, but remember, spare a thought for bats. They're not stinky, horrible animals. They're so important for biodiversity and we need to protect them. They were here first. The next creature, do you want to see a penguin? This is a little penguin. Do you know in the world, worldwide, there's 18 different penguins. This is a quintessential Aussie. I actually find them in New Zealand too, but a beautiful creature. The only blue penguin in the world and the smallest penguin. They're blue on their back. So eagles and albatross can't see them from above as they're swimming in the ocean and they're white underneath. So seals and sharks can't see them from beneath. Now this penguin actually lives in the heart of Melbourne where Deakin University campus is around St Kilda Marina. But sadly, they're under threat from foxes and domestic cats eating them. And also our litter and waste. They get trapped in plastics and they'll even eat our plastic waste. Now, the scientific name of a little penguin is Eudiptolamina, which means great little diver. They can, glide, they can dive 20 metres beneath the sea, chasing pilchards and anchovies. And they have seven layers of feathers to help them to insulate themselves in the cold southern waters of Australia. It's kind of like an inbuilt wetsuit. <laughs> Pooey, they stink of fish. So I'll put my penguin away. What a beautiful creature. Australia has got so many diverse animals and we all need to protect them. I'd like to bring out the next creature. And I believe there's some Indian students today. And this creature coming out is actually a close cousin to the Indian pale-footed wolf. This is a dingo. This is Simba. And he's my little baby. Oh, oh, bad breath though. Need to brush his teeth. This dingo here is a wolf, not a dog. You might be thinking, well, he looks like a dog, but dingoes are capable of living by themselves in the Australian bush without any intervention from an owner or mankind. And this dingo here does not bark, he howls. Oh, woo, 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 woo. And dingoes, when you pat them, they don't smell. They don't have that wet doggy smell that domestic dogs do. Dingoes have never been domesticated. And if he escaped, he'd probably run off into the bush and never come back again because dingoes are wild animals. But Simba here needs a lot of help. Through persecution in Australia, this animal is on the endangered species list because they're being hunted by man, they're being persecuted by graziers, and they eat our livestock. But you know what? Tough. They were here first. We need to protect them. They control feral animals like cats and foxes, and they also eat up all the kangaroos too. They help keep the balance. And dingoes, I love them. Remember, they are very closely related to the pale-footed wolf from India. Now, dingoes are actually white in colour too, and black and tan in colour as well. And Simba, I think you are beautiful. Now, students, I think we might go for a bit of a walk. Now we're about to have a thunderstorm at Wild Action Zoo HQ. Lots of action today. If we glitch, we're just walking our way towards our southern cassowary. Now, southern cassowary are the third largest bird in the world. And they have the unfortunate reputation of being the world's most dangerous bird because they have been known to kill people. They have a talon on their toe, which they can basically disembowel you with, like a dagger, like a raptor's toe or a velociraptor. Now, critically endangered in the wild, there's only 900 left in the Queensland rainforest of northern Queensland in Australia. And cassowaries are so important. They're frugivorous. Remember that word? They eat fruit. And they eat up all the fruit, they poop it out, and they spread seed across the landscape. So isn't it amazing? These animals have such important jobs for us as well to keep a healthy environment. Now, 
cassowaries eat up to 20 kilograms of fruit in one day. Now, the reason why they're endangered, we've taken away their habitat. They don't have a lot of places to live and they use our roads and our highways as a corridor to move through to new environments. Sadly, they get struck by cars and trucks on our roads. Now, these cassowaries here, we feed them 20 kilograms of fruit in a day. And these cassowaries are hungry today. Now, have a good look at the cask on their head, that big horn. It's made out of keratin. And they use that big horn to bash their way through the rainforest, kind of like a machete. And some scientists believe they use that horn, it's highly vascularized, to help them heat up quickly in the morning, a long black. And if you have a good look at that big wattly bit of skin, the wattle, they use that to impress the opposite gender. And on their toe, that, look out, look at that sharp claw, that's called the talon. And that's what they kick you with if you try and attack them. Do you know, students, I've actually been attacked by a cassowary in far northern Queensland. It was the scariest day of my life and also the best day of my life. It's the male cassowary that looks after the chicks. And uh, I walked into his territory and he attacked me to get basically to ward me off. We might even go and grab an emu chick in the koalas too. Is that possible? Now, I've got an emu chick to show you too. But the next animal we'll show you today, I have some koalas. Now, we all love koalas in Australia and international students, you'll love them as well. But sadly in Australia, koalas are doing it tough. Through bushfires, through disease, loss of habitat, koalas are disappearing. When I was a kid, koalas were common, but now they're vulnerable and endangered in some states of Australia. Now, you all know the koalas. They're not a bear, are they? They look like a bear. They're actually a marsupial. But sadly, their scientific name, Vascolactos, which means pouch bear, well, it kind of, it's a bit of a misnomer. Cinereus meaning grey. Now, I'm going to take you behind the scenes today into my male area where I keep my koalas, the boys. The boys and girls don't always get along. They like a bit of biffo in the breeding season. And the boys make a sound like this at night time. That's what a didgeridoo. That's the male koala bellowing, basically telling you to back off, stay out of my territory. And if you're a lady, well, come on over. And this koala, there's three in here. There's Mozart, there is Frankie, and there's also Chuck. Comes behind the scenes, so this is pretty cool. And there's a whole in here. We've just fed them. Now, of course, koalas eat eucalyptus leaves, but if you ate eucalyptus, you could get sick and die. They're toxic to most animals. But this koala here, this is Mozart, and you can tell Mozart is a boy. He's got that big, fat Roman nose. I can say that because I've got a big conch as well. And they use their nose to sniff out all of the toxins in the gum leaves. They smell every leaf they eat. Now, look at his big ears for listening for danger. Big nose for smelling leaves. But look at his eyes. They're cathemeral eyes. Cathemeral, that's a good word. That means you come out in the daytime and at nighttime, depending on your energy needs and the temperature of your environment. Now, I'm going to pick him up today, and I'd like to show you his sternal gland on his chest. Can you see that big, wet, sweaty patch on his chest? That sternal gland is basically where he rubs all of his BO, his body odour, all over the branches where he lives to mark out his territory. Now, I'm going to pick him up just quickly, and I'll show you how I pick up a tame koala. If this was a wild koala, he would rip me apart. Look at his claws. Highly adaptive for climbing, but also highly adaptive for basically defending himself as well. Woo he smells like a footy locker bit of a BO, a bit of eucalyptus. Do you know koalas? I grab a bit of koala poo here. What I do is I pick up a bit of koala poo every day and I break it open and I just basically oop, break it open to make sure they're chewing their gum leaves properly. If they're not chewing their food properly, if their teeth are wearing down, they can get sick and they can die. 200 times a day, that's a regular koala. Now I'd like to put him over here. But we really need to help out koalas in the country of Australia because they've lost their habitat. We need to plant more trees, slow down in our cars and walk our dogs on a leash. Here is another quintessential Aussie. Do you know what this is? It's not a porcupine. This is an echidna. A short-beaked echidna, Tachyglossus aculetus. And Tachyglossus, the genus name means fast tongue. And aculetus means spiny. Now, they have an 18-centimetre-long tongue for <laughs> slurping up all of their prey. 
not praying in church, but pray, P-R-E-Y, their food. And of course, they eat termites, ants, and insect larvae. Do you know echidnas and platypus? They belong to the group of mammals called monotremes. And of course, they lay eggs, but echidnas only lay one egg. Platypus lay up to four, but one egg. And it only takes 10 days for an echidna to hatch out of an egg. Now, echidnas, when you touch them, the spines, they're not venomous, but boy, oh boy, they're sharp. And the spines are modified hair. It's made out of keratin, like your fingernails. This is one of the stinkiest animals I have in my animal family. I'd like to put him away, but you might have noticed he's got a wet, snotty mouth. The, schnoz, the wet snoz actually helps him to pick up the electrical impulses of the prey which he's hunting. Thank you very much, Jamie. I have another creature coming out. Now, remember we looked at an owl, a barn owl. I have a creature coming out now called a tawny frog mouth. And in Australia, every Australian is guilty of calling this creature an owl. It's not an owl. It's actually closely related to a nightjar. It belongs to the order of birds called Capri Mulgiformes, which means don't sucker. And it has a wide, gaping yellow gob for grabbing all the insects on the wing. You would have these at Deakin University campus at nighttime. They're attracted to lights at nighttime. And footy fields have lots, sporting fields have lots of lights. They grab all the bugs with that big, wide, gaping gob. And can you see the little hairs? They're sensory feathers. They're feeling them off on the wing. Interesting, this tawny frog mouth in the middle of a drought on a 40 degree day, they basically cough up a bit of phlegm in their mouths. They hyperventilate <laughs> and it cools themselves down. It's like an inbuilt air conditioner. Flage on their back, look at the tick. They look like a dead old log on a tree. Thank you, Jamie. I've got another creature coming out now. And the next creature I would like to bring out, I'd like to bring out a kookaburra. How are we going for timing? We might bring out, and we've got an emu too, I think. Excellent. Oh, actually, we've got an emu there? Oh, I'll grab a wood duck. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Sorry, just bear with me. Hard to get good stuff these days, isn't it? Now, I didn't say that. Now, the next creature coming out, it's one for our Aussie students today because this is the creature which you get around your campus at Deakin University. You may have seen one of these animals before. It is a wood duck. Chenanessa jubata, which means dabbling duck. Jubata means crest or mohawk. They have a little hawk or a little crest on the head or mane on the back of their head. Now, you find these commonly around Melbourne and Sydney and all the way around our suburban areas of Australia. The reason why we need these creatures, never the work of animals and children, I do both. The reason why we need these ducks around suburbia is because they eat up all the grasses. But sadly, our dogs and our domestic cats gobble them up. But beautiful creature, when you stop and you look and you absorb what lives around our local areas, it really is a magical place, Australia. And we need to safeguard it and look after it. The next creature coming out, I have an emu. I did promise you an emu. It was missing in action for a bit, but this is Australia's national emblem. Now, they really are quite a silly bird, but this emu chick here is only six weeks old. Now, the dad sits on the eggs for 55 days. It's not the mum at all that incubates the eggs. And they are quite a wild bunch of birds, but emu chicks are a threatened species in Victoria because of introduced foxes and cats that gobble up the chicks. You might be thinking, why do we need emus? They eat up all the seeds, they poop out the seed, and they spread seed across our landscape. But what an adorable creature. I might even see if I can put it on the ground and let her have a bit of a run around. She's not frightened. These ones actually grow up inside my house. But they like to get on the ground and pick up all of the seed and all the dirt on the ground. Here you go. They're actually the closest cousin to an ostrich, where ostrich have two toes and emus have three. Isn't it a shame they had to grow up to be the second largest bird in the world? Look at the amazing camouflage they have. We really do live in a great country. I have another creature coming out before we wrap things up. We'd like to see a kookaburra. This kookaburra coming out now, it is my favourite friend. It hatched in my hand from an egg and it's the world's largest kingfisher. Throughout the world, there's kingfishers everywhere. But this is the largest kingfisher in the world, found here in Australia. And this kookaburra, hopefully, to finish off our Zoom today, it might laugh for us. Now, if it laughs, it's actually not telling you a bad joke. It's actually telling you to back off, stay out of my territory, don't eat my food. But one thing, we've got wild kookaburras around our zoo. If Chucky laughs, he'll call them in. 
They're actually very territorial. Come on, Chucky. This is the only kookaburra in the world that laughs on cue. Hopefully he'll do it today. Otherwise, I'll look rather silly. Come on, how'd you come? Come on. Are you ready, students? Oh, there goes the wild kookaburra above me. Now, they're actually triangulating their territory. When he laughs, his male friend will laugh, and they're basically telling you to back off and don't come into my area to eat my food. A laughing kookaburra. Only found here in Australia and Papua New Guinea. One more time. Oh. <laughs> my goodness, exhausting stuff. So students, I hope you had a good time today learning about our amazing creatures. We might actually have some questions now. You might go back to the deck for it. It's just a lag. Oh, there's a lag. Okay, we'll go back to the deck. And we'll, give me two minutes. We'll go back to the deck and ask some questions. We've got a bit of today. We, we've got a large storm coming over. So students, I want you to think about what I do for a job. It's a very crazy job, 24 seven. I studied a Bachelor of Science at the University of Melbourne, learning about all these creatures. But I've had animals all of my life since I was a three-year-old child. So remember, I had Fredo when I was a kid. I found him in the public toilet blocks in Coffs Harbour when I was a child. And we've been best friends ever since. So we're moving back to Zoo HQ office. Hopefully we'll have better reception. Hopefully you've got some great questions in, in our chat room. And hopefully you've had a great time today learning about Australian animals. Because I love them. Hopefully you love them just as much as I do. Over awesome. to you guys, you might have some awesome, questions. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, one question um, I think was, how, how, how did you start the park, the wildlife park? Well, I've owned the park since 2001, uh, but I started my company in 1994 as a very poor university student, the University of Melbourne. But I, I guess I've just built up over the years. When I was three, I had my first frog and I built up my collection over the years to 2,000 animals which now I call my family. So uh, it's been a long, arduous process, but uh, it's been a dream come true. Awesome. And then another question from a student is, how many T-shirts do you go through on average per week? <laughs> oh, I reckon I go through four or five a week. Yes, I had a bit of a wardrobe malfunction today, didn't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> um, some of the students like to know how they can come to your park. Yes, we, we actually do workshops and for our students, we can actually do a, we do like a junior zookeeper workshop for senior uh, people doing conservation, land management and captive animal uh, care as well. So uh, you can get on our website, you can follow us on Facebook and you can check out when we've got our next open days. Of course, at the moment with COVID, we're not running those types of programs because of, uh, you know, isolation, but uh, we will be running them in the very near future. Um, one more question. Have you ever been bitten by any of the reptiles? Uh, in my earlier years, yes. Uh, but now I'm very cautious and very appreciative of how uh, you know, scary some of these animals are when they do bite you. I do have a few venomous snakes. So uh, I've never been bitten by a venomous snake. I've been bitten by a goanna and I learned my lesson then. Don't do it again and be respectful and uh, be very careful. Awesome. I've got another question. Um, who And feel free to unmute and ask your own question, students, now. But um, who is the cuddliest of them all and who's your favourite animal? I have to say my favourite animal of all is Fredo the frog, which I've had since I was three. It'll be a sad day when he passes. But uh, I do love the koalas. I think the koalas are just that quintessential Australian animal. And they've got, everyone thinks they're dopey, slow, sleepy animals, but they really are quite enigmatic and they have their own personalities. I love the koalas. Just to hang out with them, feed them some gum leaves. It's the best part of the day. Awesome. And Ash, you had a couple of other questions there earlier on. Hello. Hello. Oh, an, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, yes, I just wanted to know how, what can you do to help um, our wildlife what can students do to help us help well, that's a good life. question ash no, that's a great question like it doesn't matter where you live in the world doesn't matter where you live in australia uh you can always reduce reuse recycle your waste because all of our you know, people waste goes out into the environment and can affect our animals so that's a great way to start you know locally uh, small little things at home 
reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, you know, we're all guilty of uh, putting bottles in the wrong bins at times and just going through your waste, sorting it out, um, picking up your dog poo when you go walking. Everyone's, um, you know, guilty of not doing that. Um, you know, locking up your cats day and night time. And also, if you, if you live in a built-up city area, donate some money, small amounts to wildlife conservation works and help out people out in the, you know, the front line with conservation. Awesome. Um